Well, a few weeks ago, the Central Bank of Nigeria issued a statement that it has concluded plans to redesign the Naira. CBN governor cited money hoarding, inflation, and counterfeiting as major reasons for its unusual decision. The Apex Bank claims that about 2.73 trillion Naira of the 3.23 trillion Naira currencies in circulation in Nigeria is outside the bank votes. Now, this is about 85% of the total money in circulation. This proposed policy has elicited serious debates among economists and other policy experts. Many of them hold the view that this policy change holds no significant economic benefits for Nigeria and is a, a distraction in the midst of serious economic crisis, uh, of course, buffeting. Let's continue to assess the possible cost and benefits of the plan exercise. My guest is a macroeconomist and a macroeconomic and public policy analyst. He's also a development economist, a global economic consultant and entrepreneur, Professor Ken Ife. Prof, good afternoon and thank you for joining us on the show. Thank you for having me. Uh, Prof, let's get to business. And I've got a different perspective to this decision of the Apex Bank. But I'd like you to shed light on uh, what do you think this is? As some would say, the central bank has the right to do this. But do you think that we are getting our priorities right at this time? I don't think there's a better time for them to do what they're trying to do than now. There are so many reasons. First of all, <clears throat> it is within their mandate. They got the approval of the president. Unlike the previous time, we tried to do strategic uh, agenda for Naira, and then it was botched during the uh, Basanjo's regime. Now, the main thing here is in a variety of arguments. The first argument is, oh, we have 80% of the money out of, you know, in, that's supposed to be in circulation out of circulation through the bank. So what it means is this, 2.6 uh, trillion naira that should have been within the banking system and the bank can lend it to productive activities and to traders and to businesses to energize the economy and create wealth is not there. So who is being hurt? It's our economy that is being hurt. The jobs that you could have created by having this money being you know, issued to bank there to businesses is just not happening. The second thing is that it's being used as a store of value. And to use it as a store of value um, also means that you are denying that, uh, that, that money to other things that it could do and then deteriorating wherever they are. Then the third argument is that there's a lot of counterfeit currencies going on. And that is because 20 years ago was the last time we printed. We should have been printing every five to eight years and six years is the average. So we haven't printed. The technology has caught up with us, the printers. So now they can fake our money. And you do not know how much of it that is out there in circulation. And let me explain to you that when you have the classic definition of inflation is that you have too much money chasing fewer goods and services. Now, if you have maybe twice the amount you think is supposed to be in circulation, uh, not actually uh, correct currency, then you are going to have more inflationary pressures because you have so much more than is expected out there chasing those few goods. Then you also have the issue of the, the new design is intended to be trackable. So it responds to a tracking system. Now that means that in the case of money laundering, not money laundering really, <clears throat> the case of uh, <clears throat> terrorism and ransom, it's possible that you can actually detect how these monies have traveled, the trajectory of the monies that we are, we are picked up. So you can track that. You get a bunch of Naira, they can actually tell you which bank collected it from central bank, which of their branches that it traveled to and all that stuff. So that's very, very important in the fight for these um, uh, criminal activities. Then of course you have the money laundering. You don't know the size of it, of that economy, but we do know that those monies are here to be spent and are constantly being spent um, and they will be shy to go to the banks. Uh, okay, the, the, the fertile ground for this money to be spent, of course, is the political uh, agenda, the, the electionary campaign. So why is it not necessary to do it now? Why? Why do you have to wait until after the election when all the damage would have been done? So there are more, more and more reasons. And, the, and of course, you know that there is heavy speculation on our economy. For some reason, people are speculating on the strength of the Naira 
always wishing that it, it goes down. And that speculation is only going to get worse. So when I first talked about this, I just said, and the day I spoke on it was the day that uh, the governor was making the announcement. I said, look, inflation is going to go up. There's no doubt about that. And there's going to be higher uh, cost of dollar. So the dollar val value will go up and our naira will go down. These are all spontaneous reactions. And there will be more and more uh, speculation on the currency. So all of these will kick in. It's not even going to be an inflation will come down, not now, because what is happening is that the flood is taking the middle ground. You know, over 200,000 hectares of, of crops, especially rice, are gone. So that means that there's going to be shortage of food. That's going to push up price. There's going to be imports to compensate. That's going to be bring imported inflation. And then by the time you try to get intervention will come out and then important party, then you come to Christmas. Christmas is the time that all the money needed now, the dollar to pay for that import that are going to sell, will raise the price of dollar. So all this inflation will keep up until around February. That's when it will start to stem down a little bit because we are going to be entering the farming season. So food scarcity also kicks in again during the farming season. So it will be quite some time before we now get to terms with that. But having said that, what is being done is going to be very helpful. Let me tell you, what if then the monies are going to go back to the bank? The bank should be able to scan these monies and know which ones are fake. I don't expect that the banks will take in fake monies. And nearer the time, those fake monies will, will get out of the system. And then the pressure on inflation from that perspective will come down a bit. So you can see that it's going to be turbulent time between now and January, February, it's going to be turbulent time because there's so many forces at, at play at, at the moment. So we just have to wait and see. But is it the right decision? I think it's the right decision. People I wanna, are just worried about the timing of it. Exactly, the timing and the, you know, the time we have to deposit the old notes. Let's consider those living in rural areas where banks are not so close to them. That is what they're saying. Are you sure it won't cause a form of... Fear, apprehension, and all of that, and everybody's worried that what would happen, or maybe there could be an, you know, that, that's what that's my worry. That's the feel as we're getting. Those are fake news. What you've just mentioned is fake news. Go to the rural area, you won't even see anybody that has more than 100,000 naira or 20,000 naira. They're all carrying cards. You have POS. They mean, mm. Who is carrying what naira? I don't even know who's carrying that. Mm. And then you have, you have mobile banking, you have in, in mobile internet banking. On the phone, you have a POS everywhere. You, there are all kinds of farming systems now. People are even risking their life carrying any cash or leaving cash in their house, in their homes. And those who don't have bank account, I tell you, they're also using the POS people to make. They go to the market. You see the people with POS, they have a notebook where they are registering how much was given to them by the trader that day and then how much they are paying. So they're already keeping a record. So, you know, these things are so, they're so, Hypothetical, they're not real. If you look at financial transaction, Nigeria is number six in the world, in the whole world, in electronic transaction, about 3.5 billion. Last year, we were doing 1.8 billion, and America was doing 1.2 billion. Uh, we're ahead of Brazil, ahead of America. We have gone very, very far in, in transaction. The CBN has built payment systems and licensed payment agents, got, this, got it right. That's why the growth profile, of the commercial banks and financial institutions is, uh, is about 18%. So we are doing quite well in that, in that area. So I don't see this as any, any issue at all. People don't have, don't, if they don't have it, to be honest with you. And it's very little that they're having in those so-called rural areas. Mm. Interesting, but does this now mean to you, Prof, I, I don't know, but I would like you to explain to us if we are doing very well with regards to financial inclusion, because you're talking about us embracing all of these mobile apps and or, or ways of sending money one way or the other. What's your assessment with our level of financial inclusion with the level of efforts being put in by the Apex Bank? Well, the, 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 the bank has done quite well, to be honest with you, because evidence number one, if we didn't have the level of investment in payment infrastructure in 2020, when we had shut down, there would have been crisis. But when you saw what happened was that we now saw most people, everybody used staying at home and using their, 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 their payment systems and their, their mobile and all of that. And actually, the banks grew. The growth rate grew to 15%. 
and you could see that all through 2020 and 2021, the banks were running that they was viable. Whereas in other countries, they were, they were in serious trouble. Now the, the thing has improved. It has licensed. Okay, if you look at VAT now, the, the FIRS has asked MTN and another Airtel to join in collection of that. That's because they have been licensed to collect. There are other big ones that should come in, which is consumer credit. When we get that in, you see companies that will bring billions of dollars and then issue credit cards and people will start spending. Those who have salaries to support the spend can now use their card to buy a car on lease and all that, to buy houses, and then they will be paying them instrumentally over three to five years. So that will be the ultimate. And I think that day has to come rather now, sooner than later. And uh, I don't think by the argument that, you know, uh, this poses any, any problem for the economy. Mm. Uh, well, moving on, let's talk about other issues surrounding the uh, financial space, particularly monetary. Uh, now, we, we expect uh, inflation figures, of course, soon. Uh, we don't know, but the central bank governor has said that he will continue to increase rates to rein in inflation. Uh, I don't know if we've talked about this earlier, but I'd like to ask you, if we continue at this pace, uh, increasing NPR to try to rein in inflation, how well do you think this would uh, resuscitate or help reactivate our economy? Well, this is, again, this is the transmissibility of the transmissibility of the monetary policy is actually one of the challenges that was being addressed by changing this currency. Because when you have 80% of the money that is supposed to be in circulation outside of the banking sector, now when the bank wants to contract what they are doing, they are just punishing the banks. That small money that the banks has with them is what is sucking away from the banks. And what that does is that the bank's ability to lend is diminished. And the little that they now have to lend, they will lend that at a much higher rate. Because don't forget, when you use a high deposit ratio, uh, uh, CRR and all of that, you're actually sanitizing a good proportion of the money that the banks have to have and they can lend. So you will see that they, there's a disproportionate pressure on the commercial banks by the loss of their liquidity. So that translates to a very high borrowing cost. And high borrowing costs also transmit to higher inflation because if you borrow to go and buy foreign exchange and then you use it to import goods and then you carry all that down to the consumer. The second thing is you're no longer able to reach the remaining 2.6 trillion that is out there. And consider again, there are nearly 40% of the people that are not banked. So you haven't got their money. Then you have uh, poor people, over 40% that are below poverty line, over 80 million people. So where are the money? They, they haven't got it. So you can see that your monetary policy is focusing on a much smaller type segment of the economy and very few cash in the banking sector for you to target. So, so it is a big challenge. And you could see that that is, and the other thing is that people buy, you people complain about dirty notes and then they're issuing the mint, but you don't actually see the mint. The only place you see them is in, in function areas, civic centers where they are having a party. That's where they, they buy the currency and they come and sell it and then use it in the social events. So <laughs> now if we print all these monies on the 15th of December this year, everybody will be carrying brand new uh, currency, which is not bad. You know, so that illicit trade is going to <laughs> is going to come down. So there are some of these, a lot of issues, a lot, a lot, a lot of issues that are that are connected to this measure. And I think is a good one. Well, indeed. Well, I also want new notes and very clean notes because you don't get them truly. You only see them at parties on Saturday all around Lagos when uh, you have to buy them. Uh, not, not very good. But let's move on with uh, digitalization. And um, eNARA is one of, the, um, uh, one of the policies or initiatives uh, of the Central Bank of Nigeria. But I'm looking at this vis-a-vis -vis the crypto market. And many say that is just to help you know, disabuse that market. And uh, eNARA is backed by the Central Bank of Nigeria. Uh, but uh, are they the same? Can we term them just as being, they're both digital currencies. Uh, what do you think, Prof? No, the e era is um, is not a store of value, okay? Because it does not increase in its value. It doesn't 
is the same, the amount is the same. It's not like you deposited money in deposit account and then it gives you interest. The ENIRA doesn't give you interest, but it's just a flexible way of making payments, both within the country and even in fact outside the country. You know, say, say our diaspora, you know, they, they usually remit a lot of money. Uh, uh, over five billion dollars. It used to be twenty-six billion dollars. Now, if my, if a diaspora, if some of us in the diaspora have bank accounts, naira accounts, and then we'll put money in those accounts, you don't have to go and buy dollar to send to uh, uh, your people. You just transfer money for stay where you are. People are building houses for you. You'll be using the e, e naira to settle them. So from there, you just be transferring the money from one bank to another one and other stuff. So you can do all those transactions. So on that way, it's a cross-border transaction. You can also have vice versa. A Ghanaian that has an account in Nigeria and has loaded it with a Naira can just do settlement immediately. Settles you for the things you are shipping to them in Ghana and vice versa. So, you know, so there are more things that this can do for us. Um, the people just <laughs> are not looking at those right now. Mm. Uh, let's talk about economic reviews also about Nigeria and everything seems to be on the down slope. That's what many are saying. Not just Nigeria, of course. We know it's a, a global issue. But we focus in Nigeria that is moving to an election year, a very important election. Let's, strat or let's um, talk about recovery. Recovery, yes, because we need a recovery plan. How do you think we could begin to get back to pre-COVID levels? Um, I'm not sure which segment you are looking at. Nigeria has growth, positive growth on our GDP. Not as much we as we want, have Prof. A negative, <laughs> sorry. I said not as we much as we want. We may have negative real interest rates. We may have negative real interest rate because the inflation is over 20%, 20.6%. Yeah. Yep. So that is, you know, that the spread is quite high and it's, it's in the negative territory. So if people are saving, they are paying you 3% or 5% or 10% or, or, or less than that, then you have to look at what value is being given to you for your treasury bill and then the what inflation will eat up. So inflation is going to eat up uh, more than twice the amount you are going to be getting as an interest. So in that way, you're actually on a, a, a negative interest rate. So that's the, the big challenge that we have. But in terms of other macroeconomic conditions, then you have to now finger the, the, the oil industry, which on, although on the government side, the proportion of the revenue coming from oil to government budget is actually going down from 60 to 50, and then they are heading down to 35%, which means that the non-oil is taking much control over the government revenue. Then, but, but when you now look at, and then there's an the economy that is even well diversified domestically, where the oil itself, the petroleum industry is only accounting for 6.5%, 6.6% of the GDP. So we actually have a bigger role of the non-oil sector. And then if you even look at that non-oil sector, you have ICT about 16%, trade 15%, uh, uh, in other industries, finance, construction, all heading to 10%. So you can see that there's a measure of diversification. Where the biggest challenge comes is on forex revenue where the, uh, the crude supply accounts for 79% of the forex revenue, and then the, the gas accounts for 10%. So between the gas and crude is 89%. Now, why is it such a problem? It's a big problem because we have an import-dependent economy. And when you have an import-dependent economy, it means that our economy is so vulnerable to all forms of exogenic shocks on the supply chains. So it could come from American subprime mortgage crisis. It could, form, it could come from Russia uh, supply challenges around wheat and gas and all of that, even though we are doing gas. But because we are an import dependent economy, whatever we are importing from Europe, Europe gets 40% of their gas from Russia. They are hit by high prices. So we are going to import those high prices from other countries that are affected. Of course, our grain uh, is affected like wheat. We, we're consuming a lot of wheat from that region, and they produce 40% of world wheat. So we are, we are vulnerable to all of those. But should we augment, if our revenue changes, the picture changes, for example, the, the CBN RT, the $200 billion program, 
that by 2025, we could generate up to $200 billion in rubies. That will diminish if we even get just half of that money. That will re render the oil sector completely irrelevant because we would have enough money to pay for our import. At the moment, look at what is going on at the moment. NMPC is supposed to be sending in about $3 billion every month to Central Bank from the oil proceeds. All they get is only $300 million, which is 10% of what they should be sending in from 2014. Why, why is that the case? It is the case because NMPC went and did a crude, direct crude swap with foreign refiners. I don't know even how legal it is, but that's what they did. They will send all the crude to them. They don't pay us in dollar for them to hit our bank and accrete, they have accretion to our reserve. Instead, they will just swap it with PMS coming home. And then the PMS comes in here, and NMPC turns to the government and say, you know what? I'm the sole importer and exporter of this product. Your account with me shows that what it has cost me to bring PMS is 500 billion naira higher than what it cost me or what it would have gained from selling the crude. So go and borrow 500 billion every month to pay me a subsidy. So they don't call it subsidy, they call it under recovery. So you can now see how we have been taken for a ride. One, there is opacity in the crude supply. We don't even know how much we do export. You have seen all the issues and shenanigans going on on the platforms where oil are being stolen. Second one, we don't know what we consume. People are saying, well, how much? Who consumes that quantity? Is it going abroad through the photos border? So you have these two opaque transactions being merged together to the risk of, uh, you know, I mean, I don't know. I don't know how we can run business like that. It just doesn't make sense. Hmm. Well, an interesting way and very touching way to also leave it. A lot of issues are in the plate there. I must thank you so much, uh, macroeconomic and public policy analyst, global economic consultant, and entrepreneur, Professor Kenny Fay. Uh, thank you so much for your time on the show this afternoon. Thank you. My pleasure. All right. Great.